So, salam alaikum and very good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be back in, uh, in KL. Uh, and I'm happy to see a lot of few people that I recognize in this room, but more of, I'm happy to see a lot of people that I don't know in this room. And I was talking about that during the break just now, and I just realized the audience that I have here is, is very different than the typical audience I normally have when we do a, a similar talk like this. So I believe there's a lot of uh, individuals or people representing training organization, if I'm not mistaken, right? So I believe what I'm trying to do, I, I talk here, obviously, obviously I have to change it slightly, will hopefully send a few message to you guys. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation we had earlier with uh, John and uh, Jeff, I think he just stepped out. Uh, one thing I think I, I have to mention about what Jeff, when I was watching, when we all were watching the video, the, the audio video, about how the Jeff and Sully reacted during that five minutes, that crucial five minutes, was how calm they were. I think you guys noticed that as well, right? In Malaysia, there's a, there's a new term that we're kind of introduced to by, by being calm. It's called equanimity. Okay. Any Malaysian in here, you know, equanimity, famous word? It's a big investment that we just did a few years back. Still sitting in Port Klang. So, uh, and the other one, of course, by, by Professor Paul just now. So, so thanks, Opito, for putting a rough neck right after a university professor. So my presentation, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it. I definitely, I don't have as many charts and uh, all the fancy uh, graphs and all that stuff. But I'll, I'll try to... Uh, you mentioned something very interesting just now. I mean, uh, you were, John, we're going into about a bit more in the future, how we want to be at, and uh, Paul, you mentioned about the same thing. What I would like to talk about is more of where we're at right now. And I'm going to start this with a short video. Everybody's doing video. I got to do video as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a three minutes video, and I'll run it through, and I'll, I'll talk to towards the end of it. You can cut the audio, please. That's in KL, by the way. If you notice the, the, some of the buildings behind, anybody staying anywhere close to uh, Hard Rock Cafe, Concord, somewhere around there. Okay. There's no bad ending. He'll be okay. I think he's probably still out there running scaffolding right now. So in Malaysia, and I'm sure it's a lot of places in the world, what we call this, we call this guy is what we refer to as a champion. He's a star, right? right? If you look at it, how he performed, he's very comfortable in doing his job, right? And hey, guess you, there's another guy doing it as well. So there's a team. There's the whole Jeff's uh, discussion earlier about working as a team, right? Yeah, they're very comfortable doing it, right? And then the job finished as the three minutes clips. You can watch, you can find this on YouTube. I found this during my snack learning session. That's a new term I picked up today. Right? So everything went well. Nobody got hurt. What do we call that? Zero LTI, right? We have a lot of operations where we have zero LTI, right? right? And the guy was, you know, if you listen to the audio, they were talking to each other. There's some level of planning going on. And, you know, he seems to be very comfortable doing it, telling other people how to do it. And he seems to be very, uh, uh, like I said, he's very experienced. And he also acts as a mentor to the other guy. And the guy that's holding the phone, actually videoing the whole thing. So this is an environment where, like, wow, everything goes well, job performed, done properly. Nothing goes wrong, right? I mean, he seems to be kind of aware about safety. He's wearing a hard hat. 
right? I'm not sure what that's going to do when you, you know, if you do fall about 20, 30, you know, 30 floors down, right? But if you do ask him, you know, do, do you want to fall? Do you want to hurt yourself? I'm sure the answer that you'll get is no. And one thing that have changed in the past, I would say, 20, 30 years or so, is the accidents that we see right now are no longer due to people they want to do bad things, right? Most accidents, I would say, if not all accidents that we've seen, that I've gone through, or experienced, are because people are trying to do a good job. And this individual here was trying to do a good job. And I imagine he's probably supporting families back home, kids, greater families, and all that stuff. So, what I'm trying to draw the a bit of similarities is how far is this? And I know some of you guys would probably be like, whoa, you can't believe this is actually happening. But a lot of the stuff that you see here, maybe not to this degree, is something that's happening every day at your work site, at your rig site. Right? I know I see some BP and Shell people in here, and they probably say, oh, we probably shouldn't work with that guy anymore. But this is the reality. Right? We have these problems. But today, I think, I believe we have a, a very good chance to actually deal with some of the issues. My name is Izwan Magat, and my, for the past almost two decades, uh, I've been working in upstream oil and gas, uh, specifically in uh, 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 offshore drilling business. Uh, my career started with Schlumberger in North America, and then I did the whole world travel like most of you guys in this room have. And then, um, unfortunately, I was able to come back and work in Malaysia about 10 years ago. But recently, I've moved back again to Houston. Uh, my, my current project right now is to get my two sons to be able to ride their bicycle without the training wheels. Uh, my first, my middle son has achieved that. So, woohoo, good job, dad. So, but, so, I'm revising the whole training plan right now, trying to make sure the five-year-old can actually do that very soon as well, right? So when, when I started this career, like most of the technical people in this room, I've, I've always thought, you know, my, my training was in, as an engineer, mechanical engineering. I've always thought that, you know, hey, I'm a technical guy. It's a technical part of all this I'm going to be passionate about, right? And I've always been happy and enjoyed the technical side of it. But there was, uh, as more, I've been dealing with more and more uh, responsibilities, and my last position was I was the head of operations for uh, UMW Oil and Gas here, and we ran a few jack up rigs in the region. I realized that more and more responsibilities that I get, the closer I get to safety. And I'm going to talk about this one event that occurred in, back in 2014 that really compelled and changed my whole perceptive about safety. Some of you guys may know this little church in Northern Scotland. Okay. So... It was in 2014, it was in spring of 2014, it was about late morning. I got a phone call from the rig. Uh, it was a rig, it was parked just offshore Malaysia. Uh, 2014, some of you guys probably remember, the industry just slowed down. We were still in denial, we didn't think it was going to slow down. We had a few rigs stacked offshore Malaysia. So to get a call on a Sunday morning from a stacked rig was not very common. Right? You're probably thinking, well, maybe they ran out of milk, right? You know, they just need somebody to come and you know, send a special boat for orange juice or something. So I picked up the call, like we always do in operation. You always pick up the phone. And then the, on the other side of the line was an, the OIM for the rig, the guy in charge of the, uh, of the rig. And uh, after a very, very brief pleasantries, he went ahead and said, hey, is one. I think we found one of our guy in the water. So the rig at the time, that, that, that particular rig was a semi-sub. So as you imagine, your main deck sitting more than 100 feet from water. So it's quite a way to fall, right? So from the training that we have, so what we did, all right, you know, this is what we do when something like this happens. We start making calls, alert the authorities, emergency all uh, uh, bodies and all that stuff. We get everything uh, get together. Uh, you know, we were you know, able to uh, you know, retrieve the body up and all that stuff. But unfortunately, by the time, you know, the doctors get to him and everything, he was already basically pronounced dead. We, we don't pronounce people as, as, 
you know, dead on the rig. It's a, it's a legal term. We call them uh, no vital signs, but we, we brought a doctor in, and that was happened. So, but the, the story is not about the extensive investigation that went after that, right? The, the individuals, he was mid-30s, fairly young guy, right? Uh, it's not about what we did to, you know, to find out what happened, what he did wrong, the investigation, the process, and all that stuff. The story is actually about the, the event three weeks after that was when I actually had to bring the family over to identify him and take him home. Okay? So this part, we were not really trained to do. Okay, so the family came by, so we, we brought them back. We, we brought them to, uh, they, they were from Scotland, as you can see. Uh, you know, we gave them the, you know, the best treatment as we could and all that stuff, right? And then, uh, you know, go through the process of trying to explain to, to them, the, the, the wife, the brother-in-law, and the mother of, uh, of what happened or what we thought happened. We didn't have a whole lot of information yet at the time. Right, and then uh, to the part that was was very uh, was I, I, I figure was was hard for me, but and I couldn't imagine how hard it was for them, was to actually take the family to the morgue, right? And as you know, when you start dealing with this and you try to explain to what happened, and and you know, you know the family has to to a certain point has accepted that this has happened, but until they actually saw him, you can see that they're like there is still a bit of hope. You know, like maybe Izwan made a mistake. Maybe it was somebody else. But it wasn't. So, the company, even though I was not very familiar with the process at the time, but the company had a, a procedure and a guideline how to deal with this kind of event. The wife and the mother does not have a procedure to deal with this kind of event. The wife who suddenly, the whole, whole world is turned upside down. She doesn't know, what, what do I do now? I have two young kids. They're barely a year old. They will never remember the father. What do I do now? The kids are probably too young to understand what actually happened. When I take that event, the whole three weeks that I went in, and finally, eventually, finally we, you know, we went together with them to the, to the church uh, service in, in Scotland, it put the whole safety thing in different perspective, at least for me. Because then I realized, right, when you, talk, when you go talk about safety and you talk about all the processes you want to do, it's, it's no longer just about, you know, keeping that shiny records. You go to any facilities, most facilities, right, what you see is days since the last LTI injury or something. Yeah, okay, that's important. But when you see the impact, to this family like this, and I'm sure maybe some of you guys have gone through the same unfortunate uh, experience like I did, then you realize this is why you want to make sure that your work area is safe. You're not doing this for the record. You're not doing this just for to get you know, a nice dinner from the customer or something. You're doing this so that to ensure the husband will go home safely after every hitch. You want to make sure the kids will see their father after every hitch. And in this room today, I strongly believe you guys can play that role very, very powerfully. Let's see how we do this right now in the industry. Right? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are many, many of you that have own different methods on how you manage safety. And I've seen several versions of it. But I think in general, this is how I understand it. You can kind of group things up in two, three uh, three things, which is your system, your leadership, and culture. And I'll briefly talk through all of this. I'll go with the simplest one, the easiest one first. System. We spend a lot of efforts, the industry. We spend a lot of efforts, money, time, for system. And this is your manuals, this is your management system, this is your safety case, all the posters that you see on the wall. This is what we do a lot. And one reason why we do this a lot, first, because it's easy. And you got to do it for a lot of time because you have to do it to comply with the requirement. Somebody say you have to have a safety case. Well, I'll go spend some money to go get a safety case. You need to have a good safety management system. Well, I'll go hire some contractors. They go get me a safety management system. 
and you get that. And you put it on the shelf, it looks really good. Now you put it on a CD or something, you send it all to people, right? everybody's happy. Well, you have management system? Yes, we do. We spend a lot of time on this one. The other part is leadership. Leadership is like what you and me and a lot of the guys that you have offshore, right? We need to have good leaders. Uh, we, we believe that we're very good leaders. You know, we can, I can come up here and talk about safety. I guess I'm a very good leader. But do, how do we actually train our people to be a good leader when it comes to leadership? And, and I'll, I'll say this several times, leadership is a skill. Some, very few people are born with it. Most people have to learn this. How are we actually training our guys to actually do this? The third one is culture, and culture is very interesting. And we talk about people have, I, I believe somebody, we have th people from 30 different countries in this room today. Right? So the culture, how you do things in, in Europe, in, in the Far East, and Middle East are different. The culture and how you do things in Malaysia and Thailand is different. The culture of how you do things, for how people react between Peninsula Malaysia and East Malaysia is different. The culture between the guy from KL and the guys in Kemaman is different. And this impact how people learn how people understand things, and properly how people teach as well. And why, what I would like to talk about this uh, pie chart is like, first you see, I mean, the, the, it's not to scale, by the way. It doesn't say that, you know, every, every one of them is a third of the influence. This is no quantitative method whatsoever. But one thing you have to understand is there's a big portion of this involve human. It's actually just human. Well, two-thirds of it or majority of it is human. Culture and leadership is human. System is something a bit more that you write on documents. How flexible is your system to actually handle the issue with the change of leadership and culture? Or do you just assume, as I've gone to many rigs, and say, hey, this is the culture on this, on this rig. Everybody has to follow this culture. That term means a lot of things to many, many people. And we have been quite successful. And I'm not saying that you know, working on system is a bad thing. No, it's not. It's a good thing. I think over the years, we have improved safety on the rig or offshore quite significantly by having a very good system. Because a lot of people, you know, we, we put a good system and we force people to work just within that process. And we've been able to reduce injuries significantly. But are we really doing that in a way that we should be doing it? The guy on the scaffolding earlier, I'm sure there's no process or system that says it was okay for him to do that. But somehow he was able to do it, and it was safe for him. And we all know that it's not acceptable. So how does all this impact our operation? All right. So I'm a Malaysian, so I guess I get to make fun of Malaysia. So... Uh, some of you guys might have seen this on the street. You, you, if you stay in KL over the weekend, you'll see this. It's usually on Friday night or Saturday night around the Merdeka Square. Uh, so, so if, you know, if they ever introduce this as a sport in the Olympic, I think we, Malaysia, has a stand a very, very good chance to win our first gold medal. We have not won a gold medal yet, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. Oh, by the way, he was wearing a helmet too, so he does have a certain sense of safety. I'll come back to this, and I want to relate this back to the chart that you have earlier. So this is an article recently that came out uh, in Australia, Safer Together magazine, and the, uh, the author's name is Nicole Gray. Human error is not a cause, it's a start of investigation. How often do we actually stop the investigation process when we believe that the reason for the failure or the incident was human error? We do this a lot, a lot more than what we should. Right? And then sometimes we go and we punish the person as well. I like to record what uh, Jeff said this morning. He said, like, you, if you punish a person for being human, then you're not doing him any good. So we have a system right now, a lot of it, that allows a lot of people to make mistakes. And when you have a system that allows a lot of people to make mistakes, of course, they go out and make mistakes. But what I want to say is, it's not about just the system. 
It's actually about how we train our people. And you guys touched this a bit earlier. And this is where this comes in. So you look at this individual and the guy that was doing the scaffolding earlier, right? One of the core component for safety management system to work at work site is the ability to do risk assessment. What do you think, what do you believe the skill level of risk assessment of this individual? What do you believe the skill level of risk assessment of our champion and star on the uh, scaffolding earlier? That is the part that I have seen running operation and dealing with this new upswing in activities, which we're very happy about, we're struggling with. We bring in people with all sorts of different backgrounds. As we know, a lot of people have left the industry, probably don't want to come back. We have to uh, get the rigs ready very, very quickly. There's a lot of guys coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. If in Malaysia, you know, you, a guy probably went back, work in the uh, uh, palm oil plantation, and then now you're calling him back to come and work. So we have all sorts of difference of people that understand risks in a different way. So what do we do with these guys? You know, we book a hotel room. We tell them, okay, we're going to train you for safety for five for the next five days. Right? We put them through a lot of classes, a lot of training. Guys like me come out here and talk and show all the fancy charts and everything. And we say, like, you know what? After five days, you will learn how to be safe. You know, a lot of these guys, part of the reason why they joined the oil field is because they don't like to be in a classroom. So we put them through classroom, expecting them to learn. And they come out and work on the rig. And a lot of time, they're okay. They get to go home safely. Everything's okay. And we somehow put this illusion around us and say, you know what? My method must be working. I got rigs that haven't been, you know, we haven't seen any injuries in seven years. All this thing works. But when you look at actually when bad things happen, or when you look at your near miss report, you will see, and we have seen this, we have not really addressed this. And again, you know, un unlike some of the people that actually presented the solution, I'm here to actually to, to share with you guys the problem that we have. The problem that we have is we need to be a lot more focused and specific on how we train people. We cannot uh, use the simple generic way of training guys because the guys that are coming in into industry right now are different, they have different level of understanding of risks and hazards and all that stuff. And we have to be very, very clear on how we test them on whether they are comp competent or not to perform the task. And, and you may have to get to the point where you have to send some of the guys home because he's just not competent to do the task. A guy like this working on offshore rig, he may be a very good roughneck, a good rustabout, but I don't think he's competent to do that. We need to have a method so that we can find this out and train them if we can. But if we cannot train them, then we, maybe we should send them home. Sending a guy home to his family without a job is a tough thing. But to, do, to have to do what I went through in 2014, I think it's a lot tougher than that. So I just want to end this again. Just, just one simple takeaway, and I said earlier, it's a rough neck, so I can't be too fancy with all this stuff. For all you guys in this room, for people who can actually impact this, you have this opportunity, and I hope you take this opportunity, right, to make that decision that will, put in a simpler term, right, simplest term is to allow the guy to go home safely every time. Let's change how we do things. Let's change how we actually train our guys offshore. I mean, the, the, the rig operators, we, we want to do all this stuff, but the capacity that we have, we may not be sophisticated enough. But I believe there's a lot of people in this room that can actually do that. Please go back and look at how you actually do that process and then try to push more competency and really, really strict competency. As a cert on the wall is good, but it doesn't, it doesn't do much when it comes to actually making sure that the guy is actually happy and knowing how to do it. So with that, I hope some of the ideas that I presented today may have 
may or may have not answered some of the questions that you have, right? But I hope it opens up some of the questions that you may have now as far as like how we can do in the end. Our job, at least for me in the operation, my most important job was again to make sure the guy go home safely. 